Um, because we're tight on time, I kind of want to slow the flow of the room down just a little. Um, we're talking about casual, but we're also going to start talking about some lived experience stories. So thank you, Mark. Um, this is obviously a major issue, um, a national crisis. We've got Karen Caldwell from Reform Alliance CFO sitting in the audience. Um, so we've got some great organizations here. We've got the Delta Project, we've got CARE Collective, and Reform Alliance. So we're going to hear stories um, from these three organizations, data, those who can help um, corporations hire felons, give people true second chances, um, and how it affects the youth. So we'll start with Cole, co-founder of the Delta Project, um, and you can take your away. Thank you. All right, so my, my name is Cole Williams, and I am the, one of the co-founders of the Delta Project. And the Delta Project was uh, started really from an experience that I had in my classroom in the juvenile detention center um, there in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And really the question that I asked is, how many of the young men that I served in my classroom had ever seen a brown and black male in a professional space? Um, how many of them had access to brown and black men who looked like me and that were in some capacity successful? And when I asked that question, the young men that I talked to said, Mr. Cole, that's great that you're talking about all these amazing men of color that you know and you have a network with, but guess what? I don't see those young men when I come in, when I return from the juvenile detention center and I return back to my home, my community, and my village. And so that led to a broader issue that really sparked me because I started to recognize that in asking that question, I also discovered that I didn't have that model as well, right? And so I had to work really hard to figure out how do you become, the ultimate question that he asked me is how do you become something you don't see? Um, and that's a universal question, right? But the question really is really powerful when you begin to unpack what happens to brown and black boys who don't have access to brown and black men in the particular view that highlights them as seeing them from at risk to at potential. And I think that's really what we have been really working really hard to do is recognizing that our young men have to see themselves. They have to see themselves in men that look like me and every, the young men and the men at this table. But most importantly, they have to see themselves first through a lens that impacts what it means to be at potential, right? And so a lot of the work that we've been doing is really working with young men of color in the juvenile detention center, returning and helping them migrate, I would say migrate back home, right? Because the truth of the matter, when they do re return home to what we like to call sometimes vulnerable um, communities or villages, you know, those communities aren't as vulnerable as we like to paint the picture as. These are some re very resource savvy communities, right? And so one of the things that we're doing is really trying to shift this narrative about how we see black and brown boys and how we see black and brown communities. And one of the things I'll just say that I think really speaks to why this work is so important and why we've been doing it for so long is that I have Kelvante sitting next to me, right? And uh, he and I have had a long experience together. Um, but really what challenges me is that the experiences that I had and that he's having should not have had have happened at all. And so to wrap this up for me, because there's so much that we do, um, I'll just say this, that entering into the juvenile detention center led me to prison because that's where boys were telling me that the men that they, had, they loved were. And then I got to prison and when I started working in the prison system, I also recognized that in order for me to prove to fathers that I'm talking about men and fatherhood is important to a village with children, I had to bring my sons in. So then I bring my sons into the prison with me to give them evidence of what it means to be a father and a son. And then we all are in this prison together serving, you know, young men who are returning home to communities and villages who don't appreciate them. Now he has a felony, now he has this, and so these become barriers for him to be the man that we are expecting him to be. And so what I want to tell you that has been really impactful for me sitting in this space today is that I have visited the prison industrial complex and I have seen men that look like me and I have left those prisons because I have not I've not been incarcerated but I'll tell you by hearing their stories and being present in there I am incarcerated too through those experiences and so what I'm also seeing and recognizing that I'm seeing genocide I am seeing boys entering into detention centers, leaving detention centers and going into jails and leaving jails and graduating into prison and then returning back to communities who don't value them and then if he has no value guess what happens there's a ripple effect. And now what I'm seeing is that I'm seeing boys now become fathers who become fathers who are of, of fatherless uh, sons in this whole cycle, right? And for me today, the change really starts with recognizing that we have to remove all this, the one-liner stories that talk about what it means to be a man of color. And we have to recognize that there's an array of culture when we talk about men of color and that we have to shift the narrative. He is full potential. 
this is full potential. And so I think that when we start recognizing that we have to stop putting money on things and start putting our money in people, then that's where the real change comes in for me. And so a lot of this work for us is really about doing just that. We are putting our money into and investing in people. And the best way to do that is what we're doing today. So that's part of what we do um, is that we work inside the Juvenile Detention Center. We also serve young fathers. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. So is it OK if I yeah. pass to Cavante? Um, to actually, to Lewis. Lewis. Yeah, what's the question for me? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll give you the bridge version of my story um, because it has a 40 plus year arc. Um, but in effect, uh, my name is Louis L. Reed. I'm the senior advisor for the executive leadership team at the Reform Alliance. Reform Alliance is a nonprofit uh, criminal justice reform organization co founded by a few notable people um, that you might be familiar with. Another One person by the name of Jay Z, another person by the name of Robert Kraft, another person by the name of Meek Mill, and also another person by the name of Mike Rubin, who owns the Philadelphia 76ers. No slight. Uh, to any Chicago Bulls fans uh, th that are in the room. Uh, but in any event, my connection to the work actually began when I was approximately five years old. Um, both of my parents were incarcerated and I was raised by my maternal grandmother. And so what I experienced before it was, it, it had a popular name that was now titled the school to prison pipeline is I experienced the school to prison pipeline as a result of having both my parents removed from my home. Um, and as a result of such, ultimately, when I was approximately 23 years old, I entered our, uh, I graduated into the federal prison system myself, um, having served 14 years on a 16 year uh, uh, federal prison sentence. While I was incarcerated, there were one of several things that happened with me. First and foremost, there was a spiritual transformation um, that happened uh, in my life. The second thing was is that an education uh, passport opened up in my mind where I began to see the world differently and I got me a little bit of an edumacation. Um, and the third thing that happened with me is that I began to realize and I adopted this notion that those closest to the problem are also closest to the solution but furthest from resources and power. Let me say that one more time. Those closest to the problem are also closest to the solution, but often furthest from resources and power. And that lit a righteous indignation in me. And so in the six plus years that I've been home, um, I've been involved in advocacy. I've been involved in organizing. Um, I was a part of a previous organization that passed about 15 uh, bills. We successfully impacted a third of the United States incarcerated women's population. And we also got the previous administration, uh, talking about the Trump administration, to sign into law a bill that released 20,000 people from federal prison. 93% of those people who got released from federal prison happened to be African American and were jailed for crack cocaine offenses. And one of the things that I often say is that when it comes to black, brown, and poor white folks, we have a tendency uh, to commit minimal offenses, but we get receive the maximal consequences. We commit minimal offenses, but we receive the maximal consequences. And so as a result of that, um, Meek Mill had an experience in Philadelphia that literally lit a righteous indignation into the nation. Um, and it also shined a spotlight on an issue that wasn't necessarily amplified, which is called probation or you know probation and parole. And on any given day, I know that most people in this room probably know the, st the statistics. There are approximately 2.2 million people who are currently incarcerated, but there are more than 4.5 million people who are currently on supervision, who on any given day can be returned back into custody for not committing a new crime. So for instance, if I happen to be at this panel and I was under supervision and there was someone else who happened to have a felony conviction, technically I could run the risk of having my freedom revoked. That's considered a technical violation. And so the Reform Alliance was actually uh, uh, formed as a result of Meek Mill's experience. And so one of the things that we do is, well I should say exclusively the things that we do is we fight on behalf of people who have been disproportionately impacted by the aforementioned specifically on probation and, and, and parole. And as a result of such, in the three years that we have been in existence, we are the winningest cr criminal organization of its kind. We've passed nine bills in 14 states. I'm sorry, it's the other way around. We've passed 14 bills in nine states. Uh, I'll cue for the applause, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
And, and, and essentially what that means is that we've impacted approximately 500,000 people. Those are 500,000 lives that are going to have an access to career opportunities, not jobs. Right. Um, we're talking about career opportunities. We're going to you know, try to get, create a springboard to success for these people rather than perpetuate the trapdoor to failure that they have experienced a majority of, of their lives. Uh, so welcome to my TED talk. I'll close right now in the interest of time and uh, I'll pass the mic to someone else. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Kabante Lipdrop, I'm with the Delta Project. Um, I'm 19 years old, I'm from southeast side of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, so what I do is, I just, I intern with the Delta Project coming from juvenile detention. Um, and Cole brought up the question, how do I become something I can't see? That was a big struggle for me, especially growing up in foster care and just a mess. Um, so. What I do is I work with the Delta Project. They're allowing me to open up a door to where I can reach more people in my community and reach more people my age range and reach more people who understand it better for me rather than coming from somebody else. It's better for me to do it than anybody because I'm in the same situation as a lot of people I'm trying to help. I was there recently. It wasn't that long ago, so it's more understood. Um, I also have a, my own clothing brand, which I'm trying to launch. I'm using that as a gateway to mental health. It is important that we focus on the mental health of people that are incarcerated, juveniles, prisoners, jails, everything, because when they come home, they're dealing with a lot of other struggles that we don't see. And a mental aspect is very important. So what I did was I created a brand. And with that brand, it allows people to express themselves through what they wear just making them feel comfortable and confident and making them feel good. Like right now, I'm dressed up, I feel great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so with the brand, it's too. technically yeah. the same idea. Um, with that, I'm trying to use that, my brand, as a way to fund this. Uh, there's a specific building in my neighborhood which I want to buy and open up a studio. With that studio, I'm going to incorporate more mental health aspects by allowing people to come in and learn videography, how to produce music, record. That way they can express themselves. Um, just January 14th, the day before my birthday, I lost my best friend to a pill overdose all because of a mental health issue he was going through. He did music and he didn't want to release his songs because his music was personal. I'm not sure if anybody in here is familiar with Juice World, but Juice World used his music to express himself and so did my friends. So with that being said, he dropped one song and then he passed away. He would have went farther if he would have kept going, if he would have had that somebody there to tell him how good it was and give him a mental push and just give him more confidence. So I'm doing that and I'm trying to start an entertainment company called Losses That Made Bosses. It is um, based on just people who have been through so much losses and just so much mental trauma and everything like that. And to have them sitting here and stuff like this and just expressing themselves as a boss, honestly. Um, the Delta Project is allowing me to open up these doors right now. I'm helping teach a videography class, um, Adobe Premiere Pro, showing people how to do hands-on work with cameras and editing videos. That's the aspect of music because there's music videos that have to be shot. And then now I'm, I'm um, trying to get into learning how to produce music, engineer, so that I can just... You don't, you don't need a lot of help. You can just come to this studio, record, produce it, and then somebody shoot the video that's there. Um, it's really still in planning for me. I'm still getting stuff together, and the Delta Project is helping me do this. Big. I don't have active parents. I have Cole and Joe, and just giving me that mental push after being through so much, which I'm not gonna get into, but just being through like, a lot of trauma. I know it's not easy, especially when you try to come and do stuff like this and daring to be different after only knowing one thing um, and one way of life. And so I'm glad they opened the doors for me and I plan to open the doors for multiple people. I don't have a number, the sky's the limit, honestly. Yeah, that's it. So, you were looking for maybe videographers? Well, our videographers in Michigan, 
and he, he works with the prison system. So he's doing so, and he's ready to help you. And I want to I want to give a website for your, your line of clothing. Uh, not yet. I'm actually working on. I actually have an Instagram page which you can go follow. It's, okay. I'll, uh, we have an app actually. You, you can post it on the app. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, I might, it might explode if you would actually use the app. Yeah. That's gonna take off. <laughs> keep, keep going. Um, okay, <laughs> so now we've heard some lived experience stories, amazing, amazing stories, and you might think, how do I help, right? How do I give somebody a second chance? So Liana has a whole team of people who sit and think about how to do that. <laughs> so Liana, take it away. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm part of CARE Collective. We are four enterprises that are trying to break the cycle of poverty through the power and purpose of employment. So we've been around the past 30 years. We're based in Chicago. We've helped move around 8,000 people with barriers to employment into quality jobs. And what has ultimately led to our success, I think, are a couple of things. So number one, we at CARA, and actually CARA is the Gaelic word for friends. So that means that we are not working for, we are working with individuals, leading, allowing them to lead their own journeys and follow their own paths. So when we partner with employers that understand and see the value of talent with a variety of skills and experiences, we follow them through the journey. What happens when individuals are returning to the community? So we, number one, help them get back to that experience of what, it, what does it mean to go back into the workforce? What does it mean to wake up, do the nine to five, and completely change your life through this opportunity of a job, if it's given to you. So we help individuals through that experience, help coach them up to prepare to go back to the workforce. And then once we help them secure a job, we don't just leave them there, we stay with them through their first year on the job because we know oftentimes that's when the real struggles begin, that first year. So uh, because of our model, because of our practices, we've actually had a 70% same firm one-year retention rate with our participants that we're serving. Thank you. Um, and what I would say is actually most exciting about our work right now, which is where my team comes in, is we're not only helping individuals one-to-one -one find these opportunities, we're actually working with companies to help them rethink their practices. So, Lewis, this goes back to something you were saying. You talked about the individuals themselves, they have often the answers. They understand best the barriers that are kind of tripping them up, either in getting a job or keeping a job. So we are actually essentially taking our insights, everything we've learned, helping individuals move into these jobs, to share those insights with companies as they're rethinking their hiring practices, as they're thinking about the experience that they're shaping for their employees once they're on the job. Um, and we know that there's an incredible opportunity, especially right now, number one, because so many companies are asking themselves these questions around, how do I tap into new talent pools? How do I diversify my workforce? Because we understand there's so much value in that. Uh, number two, the hiring need is incredible. We have a five million person gap between the job openings and the working adults that can fill them. You combine that with the fact that there are one in three Americans that have some kind of criminal background records. Mm -hmm. If companies have background checks, if they have strict um, criminal history requirements, that means they are missing out on an incredible talent pool. Mm -hmm. um, and both our direct experience working with employees, uh, excuse me, working with employers, and just some of the data that's starting to come out about companies that are uh, willing to invest in, in returning citizens, they are telling us that the cost and quality to hire are either the same or better um, as individuals don't, that don't have that background. Um, also, they're finding that they have the most committed and engaged talent workforce, so their retention numbers are actually better because, um, unfortunately, we know that so many people have been looked over for opportunity. They've had the door slammed in their face so many times. So when somebody is actually willing to extend them that opportunity, uh, because 
you know, people want to go to work. They want that purpose. They want to create a, a living for themselves. So once they get that opportunity, they are incredibly committed to the companies that are recognizing their skill and talent and um, investing in them. So I'll just leave you with a couple of things here. Um, if you remember anything from what I've said, these are kind of three opportunities. Number one, the biggest opportunity we're seeing again is there is a disconnect between companies um, and their understanding of the needs and experience of, of talent, whether it's uh, returning citizens or other untapped, untapped talent pools. So working with organizations like CARA, uh, or community-based organizations to get those insights and understand what it will take to not only find, um, but to support these individuals once they're on the job. That is really critical for companies to be able to understand. Uh, number two, luckily there are companies that are already doing this. So um, I would say within the last year, uh, the Second Chance Business Coalition came out. So companies like J.P. Morgan Chase, Walmart are making the commitment to hire from these communities and are starting to collect their own best practices and lead the way for other companies that are trying to figure out how they're going to do this. Um, and the last thing is uh, the, the best and kind of ideal outcome here is to help people um, and, and, and to help people in, uh, of color and to help um, communities that have been disinvested to not get to this pathway. So totally divert around the criminal justice system and oftentimes uh, a way that companies or individuals in your positions can do that is by creating more pathways, creating more opportunities either through jobs, internship, internship experiences, or you know, so many people. Uh, Kilvante, you said this, it's like trying to bridge the gap between you don't even know that job exists, you don't know that that is even a career. So where we can expose young people to these opportunities, to these careers where there's a lot of growth potential and where they can put their skill to work, that is something you can do today um, to start changing uh, these trends. So thank you very much. Thank you, Leanna. Um, yeah, I think we've got, it looks like about five minutes or so, um, if anybody has questions, but, you know, Kevin yesterday told us ways to um, make some of these communities, right, investing in these communities profitable, bankable, scalable, profit for purpose, um, and we have organizations, we've got data, you know, we have lived experience on the stage, right? <laughs> so if anybody has any questions we've got, we probably can have time for just one, um, we're happy to Can I say a quick word? Oh, yeah, Joel. Yeah, I just, I just want to say what, I'm Joel Van Kuyk, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Delta Project. And for me, being around people like Cole and Calvante just brings so much meaning to my life. And to be able to be in a space where we can truly make an impact um, in real change, getting upstream and trying to create systems change that's going to create opportunity for everyone in this world is incredibly important. Um, we're in need of, we have funding, but our funding funds our programs. Cole and I have been doing this for two or three years now. Um, we just don't have the operational funding to have a fundraiser, to have the administrative staff, to get the staff around us to truly make the impact we're trying to make with people like Calvante. So, um, yeah, we think of ourselves as resource brokers. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We want to connect people in our communities to the resources that are already there, and we want people to be lifted up by the relationships that we have in the networks that we've already built. So thank you. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? I'm curious, um, like what's the difference? I'm from Chicago, born and raised on the south side of Chicago. So, uh, you know, when, when you say grand, you know, I know these problems exist across the country in every community. So when you when you talk about um, the issues like Grand Rapids, Michigan, it's sort of, it, you know, it's still odd to me. Mm -hmm. but I understand, you know, that, that um, what happens. Um, you know, I, I've seen extendos, all, you know, all sorts of weapons, you know, and my, my friends, kids, you know, everybody is, is armed pretty much. What do you think, um, you know, are some of the, uh, you, well, I don't know if you even know what, what goes on in Chicago, but I'm, I'm yeah, sort of I'm, curious how that relates to where you, where you were brought up and how um, you were brought into your situation. I am familiar with what happens in Chicago through media, but I'm not 100% sure how accurate everything is. What I can say about Grand Rapids is it's a small city. One of the major issues is just like 
a small gang issue. Uh, a lot of kids, 14 and 15, even middle schoolers now, I've seen 11 year olds, you feel me, being recruited by 25, 30, 40 year old, getting sent out on crazy missions lately, it has been crazy. Uh, multiple shootings involving young people, massive, like if you watch the news, massive um, events where 14 and 15 year olds run into car lots like Jaguar and Ford and come out with like 10 cars. It's kind of crazy, but it's not it's not as bad. Every city has their issues. Grand Rapids just being a small city is just more noticeable because there's not much else going on. And with it being so small as well, there's limited resources. So these kids that grew up on the southeast side, specifically the Baxter community, which is the small area I'm from um, called Uptown, it's just it's so everything is so close together. Families growing up with each other, and it's just, that's all they have to look up to. They don't have sources. We have maybe one building, like the Baxter Community Center, which is right next to one of the biggest gang parks in the city. So why would a kid want to go down there and play basketball, or why would they want to go down there and, and go to this learning program if it's right here in this area and it's not being taught by the people? And then there's people who don't want to come there to to help out because they know about the violence and they know about what's, what potentially could happen to them. So I think one of the major issues is just like the limited amount of resources in the size of the city. Um, but it can be helped if people like me who are in the community, who know what's going on, who know how to stop it, can influence the right people before they are influenced by the wrong people. Hey, Brittany, I just, want, I just wanted to just say just some pardon words. Um, in the 14 years that I was incarcerated, I never met a prisoner. I never met a criminal. I never met an ex-con. I never met any of those other pejoratives that we often label uh, folks who are incarcerated. But during the time that I was incarcerated and in the years post um, where I've been working with people, I've met mothers. I met brothers, I met aunties, I met baby daddies, I met uncles, I met cousins, I met people. I met people who have been incarcerated. And I'm certain that if I canvassed the lives of every person that is in this room, uh, and I've asked you if whether or not there was some point in time in your life you did something that probably should have sort of maybe landed you in 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 incarceration. There we go. Thank, thank, thank you. I, I got my amen corner in the back. At least one person is honest <laughs> before I even ask the question. I am certain that I am certain that all of us will be able to find it within our lives that but for the grace of God, there go I. And so I just wanted to say that none of our histories should preclude our destiny. None of our histories should preclude our destiny. We are always greater than the poorest decision that we have ever made in our lives. Thanks so much. So we're going to transition. And as you do, thank you, everybody. We're coming to Grand Rapids. Just, just like we did, said, so we're going to go to the south side. We're coming to Grand Rapids. Come join our 361 firm community of investors and thought leaders. We have a lot of events created by the community as we collaborate on investments and philanthropic interests. Join us.